Hello, my name is Ajay Chankramath. I head the platform engineering team at ThoughtWorks North America. So the question of whether somebody should be building an engineering platform or not is so old. Those are the questions that we used to answer in 2021, 22, and 23. In 2024, the question is not whether to platform or not. It's about how do you do your engineering platforms? How do you build your internal developer platforms? So it is in this context that I'm going to talk about one of the key considerations that you should think about when you're building a uh, engineering platform. So the story today is going to be broken into five different pieces. I'll start with a little bit about internal developer platform. So uh, especially for those of you who are not really familiar with that, then we'll talk about the role of platform orchestrators within IDPs. And then we will get into some of the considerations to making a decision on how do you actually build an orchestrator or choose an orchestrator. Then we will actually go into some industry comparisons and a decision tree based approach to, to deciding how do you actually pick that uh, orchestrator and how do you implement that. So let's jump right in. So the first question, so what is an internal developer platform? Uh, so essentially, uh, I, you know, internal developer platform sometimes is confused with an internal developer portal is definitely not the same thing. Uh, an IDP or internal developer platform is essentially a self-service toolkit. Um, and it's used by your software developers. And think of it like a one-stop shop for all the tools and resources that developers need. Contrasting this with a portal, uh, so think of your internal developer portal as a centralized web-based platform uh, that the uh, developers will have access to documentation, resources, tools, APIs, et cetera, to build the software applications. So that will become a single point of entry for the developers to discover, understand, and consume various internal APIs, SDKs, libraries, and other, other assets that you, you could think of in your development uh, ecosystem. So a portal could always include things like an API documentation, some code samples, tutorials, and all that. But comparing this with internal developer platform, uh, think of this like a more comprehensive infrastructure that encompasses not only the documentation resources, but also tools and services, as well as the environments needed. For example, if you are creating multiple environments within your development lifecycle, uh, you might want to have something like a platform that can actually recreate those things uh, in, you know, in a manner that is consistent across the board. So this also provides a set of integrated tools and services and support the entire software development lifecycle. So now that you know what an internal developer platform is, let's talk about how to make that more effective. So there are three things that you should be thinking about when you are trying to build an internal developer platform. So what are those three things? First thing, uh, most important, self-service. So this is one of the key to platform engineering too, as we know. So the whole idea of platform engineering is that you provide your developers uh, self-service capabilities without really increasing their cognitive load. So that developers can request and deploy resources like your compute and databases and storage and things like that uh, without really having to involve other teams to do it. The second thing, dynamic configurations. Can the developers uh, have a way of providing some kind of a standardized way to define these configurations? so that they can actually say, okay, this is what I typically would need for an application or an infrastructure. The third part is, if you are building the, your internal developer platform, can you actually make sure that this integrates well with your existing CI, CD and existing IAC tools? If you have to really change everything, everything that you're doing, then that is really not going to work. And you should also have the idea of composability in there. Because if you are bringing in a solution for doing your actual internal developer platform, and if you are always going to be stuck to that particular solution, if you are really you know, locked within, within that vendor, then you are really failing in that exercise. So you really want to have an you know, integrator that will be completely independent of each other. So having said that, so the next thing to think about is that, what is an orchestrator in this context? So, so we looked at the three things earlier. I mean, those three things, essentially self-service, dynamic configs, and integrators. If there is a way in which we can really do those things far more easier, that is what it is. So essentially think of the platform orchestrator as a software system that essentially does your coordination and the management of various components within your SDLC uh, and make sure that that process becomes a lot more seamless. So how do you do it? Uh, essentially, as I said, it's going to be seamless integration and automation. 
uh, with multiple technologies that you might be using. So within your SDLC, you might have a lot of different tools in there. So you need to have your tools and workflows work as one platform, one system, as opposed to having to know you know, very specific information about each of those things. So that's how you really want your orchestrator to work. So the next thing to think about is like, why do you need an orchestrator, right? I think it's fairly obvious by now, but if not, uh, what you really want is to have your developers define the workload uh, resource needs. If you're going to have somebody else define for them, or if they have some inconsistent way of defining, that isn't going to provide that uh, developer productivity they're looking for. The next thing is environment parity, right? I mean, so I you know, briefly mentioned earlier that if you have multiple environments within your cloud environment, for example, uh, you want to make sure that there is absolute parity between, between your environments so that your production issues are minimized. And you also have situations where your workloads are fairly streamlined you know, with absolutely routine deployment tasks. So if these deployment tasks are not orchestrated well, you're going to have some challenges around that. The other thing is that you don't really want to have separate maintenance tasks on top of this for the developers, right? You need to make sure that if you put an, uh, the system in place you, and if, you're, if the developers have defined their workload resource needs, things should work seamlessly. So what are the benefits of having an orchestrator? Um, it's you know, fairly obvious again, right? I mean, so you think about it from the point if you've reduced time to market, you, you reduce your operational costs and make sure that your um, the idea of that DevOps culture comes in. So you're essentially improving that collaboration. Uh, then you also have uh, some CI system that in, that's in your place, right? I mean, so uh, if you have those CI systems in place, you need to really think about like how well would the orchestrator work with it? And you know, if, if the orchestrator works well with your existing CI system, you don't have to worry about maintaining those things separately. And things like security, governance, and scalability, you know, does not become an afterthought. It, it is essentially part of how we do things. So, um, so now, now that we know what an orchestrator is, let's think about the shape of the orchestrator, right? One thing that we always talk about when we talk about platform engineering is the fact that, you know, you have to think about your platform as a product. So this is not an activity, a set of scripts that you put together, but it's also, it's got a product life cycle. It's got a life cycle that actually goes through the whole process saying that it is doing everything it's supposed to do. It has got clear definitions of what is actually going to be built in the product, how it is built and how it is maintained over time. So there are four components I would like to you know, take your attention to. Number one is recipes. So essentially, if your orchestrator can read a recipe provided by the developers, and dynamically create the application, then that is um, one of the key criteria that you should be looking for. Next thing, we already talked about this, integrations. Now, can it integrate with your existing tool chains? If it does, then that's going to be an excellent way of uh, ensuring that this comes to good as a product. The third one is the overall lifecycle management. Can you actually manage the lifecycle of your infrastructure using this orchestrator? So if you can, then that is definitely something that you should consider. And last thing, we again spoke about this a little bit. Uh, how do you actually create those um, configurations based on the inputs from different types of groups? You know, especially if you really look at a platform engineering product, you're going to have um, inputs from your developers who are consuming this product and the platform engineering team, which is actually producing the product. So can it actually manage resources and the requests from both these teams? So that would be the other consideration that you should have. With that said, let's start looking at a potential decision tree. A decision tree in this context would be something like, how do you actually make it as an organization, make a decision on what exactly is needed to build an orchestrator as part of an internal developer platform? All right, so uh, the, the considerations here is that you should always think about it like, should you actually build it or buy it, right? I mean, this is the classic question that we always have uh, within the engineering teams. Um, it, both are possible. You can definitely build that your, on your own for, for many, many years. Uh, there are lots of teams in which and I've worked in have built these, in these tools. Off late, we really think about buying some of these things because there are some excellent options out there. So what are the considerations uh, when you're really looking at a decision tree for this? So three things in my mind. Number one, the structure of it. Number two, the complexity of the work. Third becomes like the capability of the teams. So what does this mean? So from a structural point of view, what you're really going to be looking at is, uh, are there multiple services it is you know, supporting? For example, if you are, have a very, very small organization, if you are really not you know, dealing with tens or hundreds of different microservices, you probably aren't 
something that should be looking for. The other one is like, are they like disparate systems? You know, so if, if you have disparate system, systems, one of the things that you should be looking for is, can you find a way in which a solution can bring these systems together? Uh, the third thing is that, do you have multiple teams? If you have multiple teams, of course, have providing some level of economies of scale is extremely important. So every time I have a conversation around like, is an organization really ready to adopt platform engineering? One of the first things that they consider is like, is there economies of scale in creating this? So that's the structural part of it. Now let's talk about the complexity. So is your workflow complex enough to warrant some kind of an internal developer platform? That's a question that you have to ask. Then you have to really think about what kind of transformations are there? And is there like true observability that is being built in or needed? Um, then because observability is the one that is actually going to, the, the feature that is really going to ensure that your complexity is sort of reduced. The third one before you decide this is the question of like in-house skills, right? I mean, are you, do you have the right kind of in-house skills to be able to do that? Are there specific NFRs that you need to go after, like your security requirements and compliance requirements? But also don't forget the fact that you're the Moore's model, your core versus context model, right? Is uh, building something like this your um, primary skill set as, as an engineering organization? For most organizations, it's fairly obvious because this is not your core business. So obviously you need to think about, could you actually buy something instead of having to build it and maintain it? So with that said, let's actually look at a uh, potential decision tree. So um, this might look a little bit complex, so I'm going to spend a few minutes on this. So first thing that you need to do as you start looking at the decision tree are like you know, three considerations, right? So the first consideration is that, do you have orchestration needs that spans multiple services and systems like we spoke in the previous uh, slide? Uh, if, if there is, then you really have to think about like, you know, what are those sophisticated CI capabilities and authentication management and you know, the, the other complex transformations and observability. So those things, if those things are true, then you're obviously on your path to actually get to uh, a place where you will have uh, to conduct a proof of concept to try and um, you know, buy a orchestrator. On the other hand, if you find that you don't have these requirements, it's fairly obvious that you're probably not ready yet. So in that case, you might want to use some of the existing tools and you use some kind of lightweight scripting to get, get away with for a little bit more time. On the other hand, if you find that um, your, um, your CI capabilities and some of the needs around that are not ready yet, it, it isn't uh, immediately a decision that says that you shouldn't be looking at third-party solutions. Uh, you should be really looking at it and see, uh, do you have the right kind of skills to build it? So this is where that more slow would come in, right? I mean, would you have to think about it from the point of view of, do you want to build it? Do you have your core core um, versus context uh, consideration there? And if if at that point you find that, um, you no, know, that is not really uh, you know, something that you can, you have the skills and do it, then you really, really just have to think about, you, since you don't have the skills to build it, maybe there is a possibility that you have to look at some third-party solutions. And based on that, you can really make a decision whether you should buy or actually um, you know, build something on your own. And uh, once you have all of these things, remember that most of these orchestrators happen after the continuous integration step before your sort of continuous deployment activities. So essentially, you have to really look at some of your cloud native delivery patterns and lead that into actually building your uh, complete internal developer platforms. So um, I hope this decision tree sort of makes sense. Essentially, it's a fairly simple way of looking at it based on those three considerations that we had earlier. Now comes the interesting part. Having done all of these things, let's look at what products are out there. Uh, this is always the first question that we get uh, at ThoughtWorks when we actually talk to our potential clients uh, who are trying to build engineering platforms. So in here, what I've done is that I've taken some of the comparable tools uh, that can actually do this orchestration function and look, look at it from the point of view of whether it is actually um, doing everything it's supposed to do from the point of view of self-service self uh, for, for your developers, providing the dynamic configurations as well as the integrations that's needed. So you can see that there is much not much to choose from there, right? Everything does pretty much everything that you can think of. Uh, of course, if you want to go with something like open source, uh, there are some, some additional options there, but other than that, pretty much everything is very similar. But look at that last line there that talks about what the focus of these tools are. I'm sure most of you use at least some of, the, some of these tools here. Um, 
but you can see that the focus of uh, the actual tools or the vendors that provide these things are somewhat different. And that's where we should probably drill down a little bit to understand what's it that's going to work for us. You know, so as USA potential user of an orchestrator, you potential you know, builder of an Intel developer platform, you are considering an orchestrator option. You have to now think about like what should be the way to do this. So let's drill a little bit down into that. So what are those differentiators from your point of view? So the primary differentiator, uh, you know, again, when I talk about differentiators, at least there are five things I think about, right? One is like the focus, right? So essentially, would you consider if the solution that you are using is optimized for containers and workload, containerized workloads and Kubernetes and things like that? If that's not the case, then you might want to see, are you actually doing that? If, you are, if your focus is on containerized workloads and Kubernetes, you definitely want to have a solution that supports that. The second thing, you know, what's the level of developer enablement that is needed? So if you are going to empower your developers to be able to do things on their own, is this tool ready to do that? Or are you going to have a different set of people or a different set of school, you know, scripts and tools that's going to help you do that? If that's the case, that's not really going to cut it for you. The third one, this is probably the number one, the single biggest question that I get every time that we talk to a potential uh, you know, builder of internal developer platform. When they look at their orchestrators, is it really allowing them to have standardized configurations and workflows, which obviously improves the consistency and reduces errors across various teams? The fourth one is, you know, is it really going to let you reuse your existing tools or is it going to ask you to change that your existing tool set completely? If you have to change your existing tool set completely, then that is not going to be worth it. The last one, again, becomes fairly obvious. You know, can you actually scale from where you are as an organization to where you want to be as an organization through this process? So that is something that will actually help you um, really make that decisions. So when I look at all of these things, and then these five considerations, so the five differentiators, and then when I look at all of these things, it becomes fairly obvious to me that the one that really stands out is this tool uh, from Humanitech. So if you haven't checked out that tool, definitely check it out. But again, that may not be a solution that you might want, right? Because ultimately, the question that you need to ask is like, are these differentiators valid enough for you? If these things are valid enough for you, and this is what you really want to do, you, know, you definitely want to look at your Humanitech platform orchestrator. So. Um, uh, Having said that, um, I want to just uh, leave you with some contact information for me. If you want to reach out to me and talk about any of these things or how ThoughtWorks has been recommending uh, various platform orchestrators based on various business needs, definitely um, open to chatting. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it.